Grand Rising, my friends. Let's jump right back into the mysteries. Here we have Janet Yellen as the Treasury Secretary was initially trying very hard to control what was being done with the crypto legislation and the new um, infrastructure bill coming. And well, let's just get into it. So the initial bill was proposing tighter rules on businesses and individuals acting as um, brokers and who was considered a broker, mandating who needed to report more than transactions greater than $10,000 to the uh, IRS. So it also suggests that anyone in the business of validating distributed ledger transactions, developing digital assets or their corresponding protocols, or dealing with mining software or hardware will likely to be subject to more tax reporting requirements for digital transactions. But Senators Weidman, Loomis, and Toomey um, proposed an amendment to change uh, the wording of that, the especially the definition of a broker. Um, it was initially not well thought out language, probably far too vague. Uh, there was a counter proposal by Senators uh, Portman, uh, Warner, and uh, Cinema to modify an amendment which excluded the proof of mind and sellers of hardware and software wallets. They finally came to a compromise on the amendment. Um, with this, mostly everything that would be beneficial to individuals who are in the crypto market. Um, knowing that there has to be regulation coming to the space, which is going to make the cryptocurrency space far more legitimate and stable for the long term, as long as there's United States, not just necessarily United States, but all of the country's uh, central banks, when they have rules that they feel comfortable with. Now, granted, at the end of the day, they're going to try to make sure that they make their money. So... Anything that happens, best believe that is at the end of the day, they're trying to figure out, understanding that they can't fully control decentralized ledger technology, but they're going to try their best to um, uh, scare people away from the market and anyone in the market. Um, they're going to try to, uh, as much as possible, know who has what. So that's going to be a lot of the... the, the and, and, you know, and that's the beautiful thing about cryptocurrency. Um, sometimes I'll use the word Bitcoin interchangeably with cryptocurrency, but there is a, a, you know, a great difference between the different, you know, proof of stake versus proof of work versus, you know, uh, those uh, chains that can handle smart contracts. Um, so, you know, Bitcoin is not interchangeable with cryptocurrency uh, by any stretch of the imagination. But the beautiful thing about uh, a lot of this also is that this incident showed the power of the cryptocurrency industry now that it held up the infrastructure bill why they had to uh, while they had to work on um, the language that was going to be used going forward for um, you know the next stage and it's going to be an ongoing, um, process in terms of language for uh, to regulate the market. So, you know, it's just some of the first battles, the first uh, shots over the bow uh, going in. Speaking with cryptocurrency is you have the Spiritus, an electric car made by light electric car vehicle manufacturer, Damoc managed to mine $350 worth of cryptocurrency in one month. So imagine, you know, this appears to be almost, I don't, I don't know the names of these vehicles, like, you know, it look like three wheels. I want to call it a, a, a tri-wheel vehicle. Maybe a tri-wheel vehicle, hey. But 
three hundred fifty dollars. That may be the the cost of this vehicle in terms if you were leasing this or or buying this. So you're able to pay for it. The car uses the firm's Nebula cryptocurrency platform to mine and manage Bitcoin, Dogecoin, and Ether, and other digital assets. Now, this is going to be the future. So they talk about how the average person, average community car stays idle and depreciates for 23 hours out the day. You know, that's going to be one of the arguments with autonomous vehicles is that, you know, in reality, you use your vehicle for probably one to two hours out of the day. And the rest of the time it sits there and depreciates. So if you can be out there making money for you, um, moving around autonomously, win-win. That's how your, your vehicle starts appreciating in value instead of depreciating. Even though this past year, a lot of vehicles appreciated in value. Uh, but that was, you know, this year, past year has, has been a, a bit different for a lot of things. So that's... Some interesting news, and that's going to be a future thinking about uh, maybe a, a lot of electric vehicles, if not all, will start thinking how could they, you know, validate uh, cryptocurrency no um, chains or mine cryptocurrencies as we move forward. Speaking of which of an electric car company, Tesla is reportedly going to buy BYD's new Blade batteries in an unlikely partnership. So Blade has these LFP batteries which is lithium iron phosphate um batteries which they feel has a safer cell and higher energy density at the pack level according to nail un, while undergoing nail penetration tests the blade battery emitted neither smoke nor fire after being penetrated and its surface temperature only reached 30 to 60 degrees celsius under the same conditions a ternary lithium battery exceeded 500 degrees Celsius and viol violently burned. And while a conventional lithium iron phosphate block battery did not openly emit flames or smoke, its surface temperature reached dangerous temperatures of 200 to 400 degrees Celsius. So my thought, you know, Tesla is, you know, Elon was one of the first to give away the technology of, of his kind of skateboard design for individuals to kind of look at. And here they also decide, explain how the BYD's batteries go um, from cell to pack, like um, Tesla's structural battery pack technology. Easy way to understand this is, you know, instead of just having to, you know, have a container to put your batteries in in a car, why not make part of the design of the car or space to put batteries. Um, you know, there's akin to an airplane that part of the, instead of just having building separate fuel storage in the wings, they just use the wings as fuel tanks. Um, so, you know, make it uh, easier to design, easier to implement, less uh, room for error, less room for, um, uh, failure. It's a win-win all around. So my thought is Tesla probably is buying these batteries to see exactly how they're doing, what they're doing, and <laughs> probably going to try to implement it in their design in the future. Starship, which is another one of Elon Musk companies, is in the um, process of testing their next generation of, of rockets which will be a reusable upper and lower stage. So a lot of rockets, um, especially when first designed, you know, they had one to two stages that go up, you know, first stage help it get up in the upper atmosphere before uh, suborbital, before going into orbit. The, and um, that, sorry for the brief cut. This is all uh, somewhat new. So we getting, we getting our feet wet, getting uh, our feet up under others. But, um, Moving on, so I was talking about how Starship will be two reusable stages. This, um, the, the upper stage is considered Starship. The lower stage is Super Heavy, so together is Starship Super Heavy. And um, Starship in and of itself is about 15 stories tall. Together, they're about 40 stories tall, so Super Heavy is about 25 stories in and of itself. Um, 
they'll both go to orbit or, you know, suborbital orbit and Super Heavy will return and land back on Earth to be reused in under an hour. Starship can land anywhere on Earth within 30 minutes or, you know, 45 minutes or so. And uh, but it's the plan to take us to um, land on the moon soon, as well as land humans on Mars eventually one day. Um, so we'll be keeping a close eye on the um, work they're doing down there in Boca Chica, Texas on uh, Starship. Boy, look at that 29 Raptor engines. That's what that looked like. Incredible. Fully stacked Starship Super Heavy. So Starship can carry about... I know they said they're going to reduce some of the weight on the wings. So it was around... Uh, estimated around 100 tons to orbit. Um, or about 100 people. So imagine that. Imagine, you know, the kind of... Um, imagine the... Where we see our spaceships now taking like, you know, seven or eight people and it, and it looks cramped. But now this can fit a hundred individuals uh, when they have the configuration for passengers. But for cargo, a hundred uh, tons, a hundred tons of um, cargo weight. Kratos. Kratos, maybe mispronouncing that, but I looked it up. It's a company that uh, is, is a publicly traded company on the stock market. You know, if you were into those type of things, maybe things they think about. But they're describing they are competing for a Air Force contract of attritiable vehicles and this attritable in this sense refers to aircraft or other assets that are low cost reusable to an extent but ultimately expendable this term is most commonly used in the term attrition warfare in which opposing forces attempt to wear down one another by forcing the other side to expend their resources and personnel until they can no longer fight in the case of uavs this would mean imply aircraft this would mean imply that are designed to be able to be lost in combat without causing significant harm to the outcome of an operation. So, you know, Kratos is working on the uh, Valkyrie, the uh, XQ-58 Valkyrie, which is like a UCAV, unmanned combat aerial vehicle. So imagine a fighter plane without a pilot. So being able, like the movie, what was the movie with... Uh, Jamie Foxx, Jessica Biel, uh, Stealth. So imagine that plane, because of course they're going to put artificial intelligence in and, and autonomous abilities in these planes in the future. Um, that's what the uh, Valkyrie is. Now these planes are attend. I'm I'm guessing, or the way they're describing it, being very vague, and they also said that it's fairly secret, and only as if you get approved contractors will get more. Um, of a briefing from the Air Force, exactly what they're looking for, but reading between the lines, which we do here, uh, my thought, and you know, we, we'll see, is that they're looking for low cost vehicles that are pretty sturdy, stable, basically Starlink on Earth. And what do I mean by that? One of the biggest fears I imagine in the military, and it seems from some of their, uh, um, acquisitions and um, and I think we'll, it's another article we'll talk about I believe um, tomorrow there um, what happens if our information advantage is taken away from us in a war what will we do what if we lose our satellite satellites what if we use GPS so, and, and, and as any, you know, great military mind would tell you, you have to prepare for every eventuality. So my thought with a lot of this is that they're going to build out a system they can throw in the air that's almost going to be like, what if our satellites get knocked out? We still have the ability to communicate um, locally to our local forces 
um, in the same manner in terms of having a, a, a hyper awareness of the information um, of space, you know, so. But, you know, hey, look, they can make a swarm of bombs that just, you know, uh, uh, detect you, uh, sensed by your DNA and swarm in and kill you. <laughs> uh, we'll see. But when I was reading this, I was thinking now, what would they need these kind of um, easy, expendable drones that are uh, well built to last out in um, um, harsh environments? Um, networked out in a in a bunch of them swarmed in the sky. You know, either it's gonna be communications or it's gonna be a uh, um, rain down um, uh, uh, destruction upon one's enemies. Apple. Now this is a very controversial. Topic for some, I'm. Uh, what they're doing is noble, and you know the fear is just well. If they have the power to do this, what else do they have the power to do? But as anyone who has any understanding of how the world works in this new digital age, is if you do something online, it is being imagine that it's being looked at, um, or is being recorded. Uh, so. You know, Apple has a plan now to scan U.S. iPhones for images of child abuse. Um, I'm personally 100 percent fine with this. <laughs> um, they're going to use they said they're going to still be able to keep people's privacy by uh, Apple said this messaging app will use on device machine learning to warn about sensitive content without making private communications readable by the company. So. Uh, you, you know, they're working with, who is it at? Um, Apple believes it's pulled off the feet with technology that it developed in consultation with several prominent cryptographers, including Stanford University professor Dan Bon, bon whose work in the field has won a Turing Award, often called technology's version of Nobel Prize. So they're working with people to try to set up uh, safeguards in place to ensure that they're they are not uh this technology is being um, um misused to go through everybody's images and you know basically a hey, scan through everybody's images and, and and give me back uh behavioral profiles on everyone which sounds terrifying and you know possibility but um you know if we're going to have privacy, we have to also have some some type of now this is more of my opinion than anything that is um, a statement of fact. So, you know, take it with you, May. Um, if we're going to have privacy, then we must be willing to police ourselves. And if we, you know, and humans can't be trusted to police themselves individually, then whatever form of privacy we use and be it if we're meeting in someone's house or you know using these devices by these companies you know it's incumbent upon that individual to say i'm gonna make sure things are not happening uh under my protection that you know is untowards and i'm fine with that i am fine with that so with that said i'm gonna go ahead and punch out Everyone, I know you will have a great day and remember that I love you, you love yourselves, God loves you, and that's all that matters.